Good morning and welcome to the 35th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones as meeting papers are provided in digit format. Tablets may be used by members during the meeting. The committee is invited to consider and agree whether to take agenda items three and four on the consideration of evidence heard today in relation to the committee's budget scrutiny for 2019-20 and the committee's work programme in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The committee will take evidence today on the Accounts Commission's recently published financial overview report to help us in our consideration of Scottish Government budget for 2019-20. And I welcome Graham Sharp, Chair, and Fraser McKinley, Controller of Audit Accounts Commission, Brian Howarth, Audit Director, and Ashley Magite, Senior Auditor, Audit Scotland. And I invite Graham Sharp to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, Convener. On behalf of the Accounts Commission, I welcome the opportunity to discuss our 2017-18 Local Government Financial Overview Report with the Committee. Our findings are similar to last year. Scotland's councils have continued to manage their budgets well while facing an increasingly complex range of challenges and continuing pressure on finances. Revenue funding to councils reduced in 2017-18 by 2.3 per cent in real and 0.6 per cent in cash terms. However, this reduction was largely offset by increases in council tax and fees and charges. Councils also used savings and reserves to manage budgeted funding gaps of £0.5 billion, or 4% of net expenditure. The impact across services varies, with increased spending in education and social work, balanced by reductions in other services. Councils are having to make hard choices about services. The position varies from council to council, but overall there is clearly a continuing need to make major changes in the way services are provided. Last year, we highlighted the risk for some councils in planning to use significant amounts of their reserves to manage funding gaps. I am pleased that this year, although overall reserves have continued to reduce, no council is planning to use its reserves at a level that risks its financial sustainability in the next two to three years. Scottish Government revenue funding for 2018-19 increased by 0.2% in real terms and councils expect to manage smaller funding gaps over 2018-19 of £0.3 billion. However, the Scottish Government's five-year financial strategy, published in May this year, identifies greater future uncertainty and indicates likely further reductions in funding. One of the other most significant challenges for councils is financial issues associated with integration joint boards. A report notes that while funding to IJBs increased in 2017-18 by 3%, including additional funding from the NHS, the majority of IJBs have underlying financial sustainability issues. Without year-end support from both the NHS and council partners, 20 of the 30 IJBs would have reported deficits. Last month, we published a report on progress with health and social care integration. This highlighted areas for improvement, including financial management and financial planning. Convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for that. Can I just start off by, um, and you mentioned this uh, in your short statement there, the sort of changing profile of local government funding, uh, revenue funding, the decreasing settlement, as you say, from the Scottish Government in the context of the increased income from local taxation fees and charges. Now, given that we hear regularly that local government is under pressure, as I accept that all uh, the, the, the Scottish Government and other areas are as well, but in your own report you say that the net result is basically a flat line, that there is no difference. Could you explain to us, A, what this changing profile means? Does it mean there's less money going into local government in total, or does it mean that it's just less easy to see? Um, well, first, it's, it's true to say there is continuing and increasing, increasing pressure on finances as the main funder being Scottish Government, its funding reduces. Um, currently, it's about 55% adding the, the NDR and direct, direct funding. So um, any organisation faced with that will, among other things, look at options to uh, replace that, that gap. And in the case of councils, the options they would have would be local taxation, um, 
fees and charges, and indeed commercial activities, which, as we've reported to this committee in the past, is, is less prevalent in Scotland than it is in some parts of England. So um, this year, or 2017-18, it is a flat line in terms of funding, but, but the, the balance of how that funding is made up has altered. But you, would you also, given the, your last comment there about um, the charging uh, at local authorities, would you give them that there's more scope to close that gap further or even to make sure there was more money available to go into local authorities? Well, I, I think the scope for um, sort of taking advantage of the different theoretical options open uh, is a policy decision for local councils dependent on their particular circumstances. Uh, and what what we see um, looking at 2018-19 is is that everyone's going for maximum council tax, and they are looking at other ways of, of raising funds. And clearly, that will continue to be an option. To what extent it continues to provide additional funding, I, th I think is something we'd have to see. But um, colleagues may have a view. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you, Convener. I think the other thing about particularly charges for services, and we touch on this on page 15 in the report, is the real variation that we can see across councils in terms of what they charge uh, for and how much they charge for some of those services and we give some examples there so i suppose in terms of your original question about what the impact is some of these things do have a very direct impact on the people needing to use those services um, and throughout the report you'll see that down the right hand column we've we've put in some questions particularly for councillors really they're designed to to ensure that councillors are asking the right kinds of questions when it comes to budget time and these kind of decisions around fees and charges are being are being made. We, we need to be sure, councillors need to satisfy themselves that they're they're making these decisions with a full understanding of what the impact will be on their communities. Right, OK. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move on to another uh, question, but just on that itself then, there's a recognition here that the differential is down to the local authorities. This has nothing to do with government. The government have given them the... The, the right and the ability to make these charges as they feel appropriate and it's a case of the, the councils then have to get that information out to their, their own residents. It, so, so yes, and I would say that it's still relatively small in the context of overall local government funding. So, so while some of the increases, for example, that we use in paragraph 26 are significant, they are a very, very small amount uh, in, in the grand scheme of things. And, and as members will know, there continues to be quite a lot of debate about the way in which local government is financed and the extent to which that's financed locally through a whole range of local taxes or the extent to which it continues to rely on central government grant. Okay. The only thing I'd add to that is that um, there is quite a wide variation in, in the sorts of things and the level of fees that, that individual councils charge for. And over time, it may be that that um, begins to flatten out, but that, that would be speculation. Okay, thank you. Graham, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just to follow up on that... Um, uh, on, on paragraph 26, um, uh, and you say there's, uh, you've analysed uh, 16 uh, different types of charges uh, which councils are putting up, presumably. Um, I was struck by the first two, um, purchase of a, a, a grave or lair uh, and adult burial. I wonder if there's any evidence of councils um, putting up charges on things that they might see as easy hits, i.e. Le less con less likely to be controversial. I, d I think um, when councils can consider what to do, they, they look at a number of different factors. Certainly, one of them will be in, and ought to be the impact on 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 the public. Uh, another factor will be that they, they will look at what other councils um, have charged for uh, and and how they compare. And, and I don't think we start with a level playing field there, as, as I referred to at the end of the, the, the last question. So there may be situations where um, councils could actually introduce or, or significantly increase charges just to bring them up to levels that other councils were charging at, but they weren't. So I think at this phase where th that's why I said there might be a sort of flattening out as people see what else is being charged for and, and bring those into line. So that, that's one factor. But... Um, do you want to? No, I mean, I think you members will know better than we do from your own communities, I'm sure, that you know some of these things can be very controversial. Do you know, when I live in East Lothian and car parking at beaches became a very big local issue. Um, so it's those, those are exactly, as the Chair says, the kinds of uh, judgments that, that local politicians are needing to make, and, and they are needing to make them 
more often, I think, for sure. Thank you, Alec. You want to just, just on that point, could I ask in terms of benchmarking, is, is there evidence that, that the benchmarking tools that were developed through COSLA and others are actually being used when, when looking at budgets and looking at what different authorities are doing and trying to achieve best practice? Well, in, in terms of the local government benchmarking framework, I mean, that, that, that is used by, by all councils uh, and indeed their, their position is, is published as, yep. as, as a matter of course and, and we um, require them to do that. Um, in, in, I was making a different point in terms of um, charging for services where that's not necessarily picked up in an in individual benchmark test, but, but it is something. It is an exercise individual councils will go through when they're considering their own fees. They, they will look at what other councils are doing so that there will be a, a sort of bespoke benchmarking, if you like. And Brian, did you want to say something about this? Um, I could probably add something just on, on both on both points there on the um, fees and charges. Um, <clears throat> I mean, casting my mind back to this committee last year, I think there was a point made when the SPICE briefing had come out last year that I think was described as a bit of a roller coaster in terms of the data around fees and charges. Um, and this year's report that we present to you is, a, is our um, attempt at providing more insight into that. And uh, we would like to increase the work we do around the insight in terms of fees and charges. Um, so we picked a selection of fees and charges from quite a cross range of things and these are the ones that we've picked out as being the most marked in terms of changes. Um, I think as we go forward it would be more useful to give you a, a completer picture of the range of things we're asking about and the, the increases. Um, on the benchmarking um, information, um, we're going to issue a report in March about um, uh, the benchmarking performance and that's you know significantly based on the um, improvement service benchmarking data. Um, so that will build on the analysis that we're able to bring to you about benchmarking of uh, performance and the, the costs related to those. Thank you. Can, I'd just like to move on to, you talked in your report about the overall increases in spending in education and social work being offset by reductions in other services. Have you seen evidence is that significant also have you given any advice or guidance into how local authorities could look at that um well first of all education and social work together are roughly 70 75 percent of expenditure so if if those uh, areas do not see any reduction in spending and indeed see a, an increase clearly you've got a gearing effect on, on any global reduction on, on the remaining services. So um, we, we, we quote um, the figures taken from the, the, the Scottish Government um, five-year look forward and, and some of the analysis that's been done in that, where there's a projection that, 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 that in, the, in the middle uh, scenario, it's a 9% reduction over the five years in, in non-protected services, which is, would affect local government. And so you get that sort of gearing, and it, it's down to councils to set their own priorities. Um, and it, clearly, it's a whole mix of services. There, there are frontline services that, that the public see immediately, sort of condition of roads, um, waste collection, but there are also services that the public don't necessarily see, such as regulatory and inspection services, planning. Um, which nevertheless affect the quality of, of life in, 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 in the longer term. And it's, it, it's for councils to sort of balance that if they've got protected areas that, 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 that they just have to manage the balance uh, according to their local conditions. Yeah, but once again, this is a decision that the local authorities have to make on their own and uh, it's just a, a judgment, valid judgment. Okay, uh, Andy, you've got a couple of questions, I believe. Uh, I've got more than a couple. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, in key message three on, in part one, you talk about there could be more transparency uh, to ensure clarity about how funding distribution um, uh, works. And I take it this refers to exhibit four in paragraphs 18 to 20. Um, we've had discussions in this committee before about the transparency of budget figures, but obviously we will wait and see um, how, how transparent they are. Um, but I'm just wondering if you could clarify a little bit, but you say that in paragraph 18, the basis of the calculations are not publicly available. Um, I presume the calculations exist, they 
the fact of them exist and they could be FOIable or whatever, but you're noting that we, we, they're, they're not published as such. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on the significance of Exhibit 4, which seems to me quite a you know, very, very interesting little bit of analysis you've done. And also paragraph 15, when you say the total amount of grant-aided expenditure has remained at $7.9 billion. I thought grant-aided <coughs> expenditure changed all the time, so maybe you can clarify that as well. Um, I'll, I'll perhaps ask Ashley to, to provide more detail on this. Um, deal, dealing with the second part first, um, what we're saying is that the, the base of the calculation was frozen in terms of um, the, 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 the proportions of the, the elements of it. It's not the amount that's frozen, so the amount continues to increase, but um, it, um, the, it isn't uh, looked at anew each year. Um, and I, I think the SPICE report in, in um, June this year commented that the share of total revenue funding that's distributed on the basis of relative need has decreased over time precisely because that that formula has been hasn't been um, renewed for 10 years um, so so that's that's one point uh, the second point on, on exhibit four um, we put that in for, for, for illustration really to, to to show that we can demonstrate a strong correlation with population and and expenditure and, and allocation of expenditure over councils. We are, we are really unable to, to show that strong relationship in the case of deprivation. It's, it's a medium to weak correlation. And, and therefore, it, it sort of raises a question um, to the bodies that, that, that decide on the, the funding formula, i.e. Um, COSLA and Scottish Government, as are you satisfied with the, the, the current arrangement? And that's, that's the question we're raising. But, but Ashley might be able to provide a, a little bit more background on the GAE. And yep. Um, so the GAE makes up part of what's called the updated service provision, which is column one in the circular. Um, and that amount has stayed exactly the same since it was uh, put in place in 2008. Um, it's made up by the 89 indicators that we talk about, and that's very public in the green book. So you can, you can work all that through and work out how it works. The 3.7 billion um, that we talk about in paragraph 18 is the bit that changes every year. And that's made up of um, historic uh, ring fence grants, new policy commitments, and additional funding. And these are the bits that we say aren't transparent. Um, some are based on the weightings that are already in the J GAE, and some are uh, individual methodologies that are decided by the policy team and then the uh, SDG group that we mentioned in paragraph 20. And so that's the area that we say um, is less transparent. We haven't seen sight of those. OK, that's very helpful. I mean, I, I know that we should know all this stuff, but I find I'm still finding trouble with the funding formula. So when you say since 2008-9, the total amount of GAE has remained at 7.9 million, that, that is an accurate statement. That OK. And so that marries with your comment, Mr Sharp, that because that 7.9 billion has been frozen, the amount that is subject to a needs-based distribution has gotten less as a proportion of the total. Yeah, I think that's yes. the point. That's fine. OK, yeah. that's good. Hey, great, thanks. Um, on Exhibit 2, um, where you talk about the revenue grant funding falling by 1% um, in 2017-18 and then NDR 5.3% on a smaller amount, but that, that, that um, leads to 23 And then your um, Exhibit 1 shows the 55%. Um, of what you call total revenue funding. Have you always presented NDR as part of government funding, given that it is local government's own I'd, tax, I'd, although it's pooled and redistributed? Co colleagues will have to help me on the history. Um, I, the, the, the reason I, I believe we do that is because of the offset, that, that what's guaranteed in, in, in the budget is, if you like, A plus B, not A or B. And and A is is the government grant and B is the NDR. But so, so, so the short answer is yes. Yes, we have always presented it, and it's exactly for the, the reason that the chair says if if in if non-domestic rates income in a local area and a council area is less than anticipated, then that is made up through the revenue grant. So you so we think you have to kind of look at it in the round. So we think it's important to separate the two things out, but we do think it's reasonable to present it as uh, as a whole. 
Okay, and just to be clear, non-domestic rate is subject to the granted expenditure calculations, or that part that's part of seven point nine billion. So well, this is where it gets quite complicated. Oh well, maybe maybe you can write me a letter about it. <laughs> we, we don't have a whole morning. Or, Maybe we could have a seminar. We, we tried to simplify what, what we <laughs> presented on the formula uh, this year because otherwise it can take over yeah. the report. Um, just on a, you also make a comment in, in, in the report about the fact that some councils have complained that they'd set their budget and then two days later they got the final settlement. Um, again, has that changed substantially over the years of devolution? We've always been following the autumn statement and we've always been sort of crashing into local government's own budget process. I think it was mainly the adjustment, but Fraser, do you...? So, so the t again, as, as members will know better than we do, the, the, the timing is always such that they are pretty close. So, the, you know, obviously we'll get the budget this afternoon at the high level and then there's a process until uh, we get into early spring when, when the final position is, is known. So certainly councils are used to making those kind of adjustments, at, if you like, at relatively late stages. I think the main difference this year, if, if this is what the Chair is referring to, was that £35 million that we mentioned in Exhibit 2, yeah. which did come very late in the day. Mm. Um, but but in a sense, it was, and obviously in relative terms, that's a relatively small oh, yeah. amount of money. But you know, equally, for some councils, it still makes a difference uh, mm. individually. But no, I think the, the general budget cycle, I think, um, is, is unchanged. I think what, what we would say is that councils now we think are much, much better both at medium and long-term financial planning. And, and one of the impacts of that is, that in a sense, the budget cycle doesn't really stop. I think if you were to look back five years, the budget process were, happened, you know, kind of between now and February when they had to set a budget. Increasingly now, councils are doing that on an ongoing basis. So from that perspective, it's, it's less of an issue because they're much better prepared, I think, uh, with things like scenario planning and modelling to, to make those adjustments when they come in in kind of January, February time, um, so so they're be they're better placed now to to deal with those those changes than they would have been in the past. Okay, so I would just add that I think in the two years that are mentioned in the report, one is seventeen eighteen, and later on we talk about eighteen nineteen. The lateness of the budget proposals was an issue raised by many councils with us, and I think probably what's changed is I can't really say whether that was the case in previous years, but what's probably changed is. Um, with reducing resources available, it probably makes the decision-making process a bit more tortuous for councils in a shorter time. I think that's probably what feels different in the last couple of years, perhaps. Okay, and then just finally, in paragraph 36, you um, introduce us to Northamptonshire County Council. Um, I'm just wondering why you're talking about an English council. Obviously, it's an example of a council that's having to use almost all of its um, general fund and, and, and reserves, um, but maybe you could sort of is that the only reason? Uh, but then secondly, more, that's my final question, um, you know, where stands Scottish local government financially in comparison to English local government? Um, well, I, I think one, one, one of the purposes we had in, in, in using Northampton was, was just to illustrate some of the differences because um, I think it is, it is um, not straightforward to compare Scottish local authorities with English for a number of reasons. Um, the structure's different. You've got three different tiers of, of local government in, in, in England. You've got 32 unitary authorities in Scotland. They do different things. And also the funding's different. And I think we showed that with Northampton. Um, as we've just discussed, 55% um, of funding uh, coming from central government in Scotland. In, in the example we showed Northampton, 17%. Um, half of Northampton's um, Funding coming from fees and charges, 25%, and overall in Scotland. So, so, so the funding structure is quite different. So, therefore, if you say there's an X percent reduction in central government funding in Scotland, which compares with a Y percent reduction in England, you're not comparing apples with apples because the significance of the different funding streams is different. Okay, thanks. Andy Kenny, you wanted to come in on this? Yeah, the significant, there are significant funding streams. What's clear is that, um, as reported just last week, is that there has been a 60% reduction in, um, in UK government funding to local authorities in England, and 50% of our local authorities in England now receive zero grant funding, which is why there are crises in place at Northampton and even uh, in Surrey and other places. But So I really wanted to kind of uh, uh, look basically at... Um, 
Examiner, you uh, more the kind of issue that you touched on in, in your opening, Mr. Sharp. You said that there are major changes in the way services are provided. And if we look at paragraph two, it says here that thir uh, only 13% of income, 2.3 billion, was generated through council tax, but 25%, 4.3 billion, through fees, charges, uh, and grants credited. So I'm wondering. Um, what kind of innovative and imaginative solutions are we actually seeing, either in Scotland or indeed south of the border, um, you know, to, to help uh, local authorities improve the funding? We've already seen, as that paragraph shows, that in, a, um, uh, in, in that year there was a £328 million increase in, in income from those sources. So I'm just wondering, uh, what, can lo what are local authorities doing now that's more innovative and imaginative, and what can they do? possibly learning from the situation south of the border? Well, in terms of, of what, what they can do, obviously there's a whole set, set of things on the service side, um, and that's where we talk about transformation and, and choices on, on priorities. And, and we'll look at that more in our spring report, which will focus on the challenges and, and service side. And this, is, this report's more about the, the financing side. Uh, in, in terms of financing, um, uh, as, as we've been d discussing, the, the structure of financing is, is rather different in England. Um, uh, and one clear difference that we've referred to, to before uh, at this committee is uh, the degree of, of commercial income in, in England, for example, where there, there are councils that have significant commercial income in England. Um, and that tends not to be the case in Scotland, though clearly it will be one of the options that councils look at. Whether there is the scope to be able to do that to the same degree as there is in some parts of England is, is an open question. Um, but um, I invite colleagues to, if there are any particular examples. Um, I, think, I think it all depends on the risk appetite of the individual councils. I think that um, one of the issues possibly with commercialisation is it increases the risk exposure of councils. We are seeing some extent that happening. Um, the, the examples I would give actually aren't particularly within the report. It's to do with some of the Scottish pension funds that are moving in, into investment in, uh, in infrastructure uh, projects, schemes. Um, so I think we are seeing it around the edges. I think the one council we probably note is doing most in this area, perhaps, that I'm aware of is Aberdeen City in terms of its Marshall Square investments. Um, but that does mean, as we say in the report, taking on additional borrowing um, with the expectation that will produce investment returns over time. Um, you know, that with the benefit of hindsight in the future, we'll see what success that has. But it is it, it does increase the risk exposure, I would think, of a council of exposing itself to commercial returns as a major part of its budget process. Well, figures seem to show that Aberdeen have got the second highest uh, debt ratio of any local authority. I mean, in North Ayrshire, where I, I'm an MSP last year, the, the, the local authority voted 17 votes to 16 to reject a commercial proposal which would have meant uh, the purchase at uh, a cost of uh, some £55 million of a, a 47-year-old retail centre and then £17 million to refurbish it. We've seen what's happened to retail in the last year, so one wonders um, how sensible some of these ideas are. But I'm just wondering if, if there are any that have been particularly successful that you think can be implemented here in Scotland to the kind of ideas at least. And, and also, Mr Sharp, you talked about choices and priorities, but surely with local government a lot of it is not about choices. It, you know, you know, you you have to do, you have to provide um, social work provision, you have to provide education. The the room for manoeuvre in local authorities, I would suggest, has been diminishing over the years, and statutory provision is becoming a higher and higher proportion. So, that's why I'm looking to see what kind of ideas local government can perhaps examine to try and improve their their kind of funding situation. Well, and in terms of choices being limited, I, I think that was illustrated by the 75% of expenditure being on, on social care and education. Um, but, but there are still choices that will vary according to local conditions across councils on the remainder, and, and the remainder is still important in terms of, of balancing budgets and, and the quality of service provided. I mean, I think the, the, the whole question of... Statutory provision is a really interesting one, Mr Gibson, because actually statutory provisions for a lot of council services are pretty broadly drawn. So you, so you have to provide an education service. There's loads of different ways you can do that um, to do with you know, the length of the school day and all those kinds of things. And for me, th there's, two, there's two different kinds of innovation, I think, that, that are important to reflect on. One is primarily, as the chair said, about improving service delivery, which may also impact on efficiency. And I think some of the schools building programmes that you've seen partly in Ayrshire and other places 
um, have been genuinely transformative for local communities. When you see some of the, uh, the new campuses that are being built in, in some uh, in some communities across Scotland, making a huge difference. And that's not just about education, they are, they are important community facilities. The commercialisation thing then is where I think Scotland is uh, a bit behind, although I use, that, I use that phrase carefully because actually I don't think anyone would want to see some of the stuff we have seen in England, where very small councils have been buying out of town, in fact, not just out of town, out of area shopping centres for purely commercial purposes. And SIPFA in the UK are, are currently consulting on, on a new code that basically says we don't really think that's what borrowing public money is for. So there's a kind of a philosophical question really about whether that's a, a reasonable thing to do. Maybe quite different if there's a, you know, a shopping centre in the middle of your town that the council thinks they can invest in and, and transform in as part of a wider regeneration activity. I think that's one thing. So as Brian says, there's a kind of risk appetite thing. And certainly as auditors, what we're interested in, uh, Brian mentioned Aberdeen City, as well as the Marshall Square, there's obviously uh, Aberdeen City are the one council in Scotland that's gone to the markets. They, they had a bond issue um, to, to support infrastructure investment, including a new Aberdeen uh, conference centre, um, which is a new and, and innovative thing. And again, as the chair said, what, what, we, what we're interested in is not whether that's a good decision or a bad decision, that's for the council to decide. What is absolutely critical is that councillors in particular, when they're making that decision, fully understand the risks and opportunities associated with those decisions, because these are becoming increasingly complicated and complex financial transactions. So it's doubly important that councillors really understand what they're getting themselves into. Can, can, can I just add, just to, just to, just to, to follow that up, is there, is there much best practice in, in Scottish local authorities, an issue I've banged on about for many years, in, in this particular area, in terms of sharing kind of uh, advice and information? Because one thing uh, um, people get upset about um, is when they maybe when they see large amounts of money uh, being spent, for example, on external consultants by local authorities to advise them on these kind of issues. So is there a, a, a strengthening of, of knowledge and understanding in terms of these issues? Is there a sharing of you know, what's, what's went well, what's went wrong, um, in order that local authorities reduce their risk, but at the same time can become more innovative and, and can come up with new ideas to generate additional incomes? So, so the short answer is yes, we would always like to see more of it, but um, I think the key things are certainly around the finance area and some of the things we've been talking about, the SIPFA Directors of Finance Group is pretty active, that's quite a good network. Um, APSI, the Association of Public Service Excellence, are a very good network UK-wide for exactly some of this stuff. They've done a lot of work around commercialisation and uh, the commercialisation board was most recently chaired by a councillor in Dumfries and Galloway, as it happens. Um, so quite well plugged in there. The Improvement Service, obviously, plays an important role. So so I think I think the challenge is, is the way in which you can learn, and, and this is where I think it is a, a challenge, because there's something about the scale for us, I think. So there are pockets of good practice that people know about. The trick then is how you take that into your place to make it work for your set of circumstances in a way that actually begins to make a difference at scale. At the moment, some of this stuff is kind of at the margins. Uh, and, and I do have a bit of a concern, I suppose, that while education and social work are in financial terms being relatively well protected, that doesn't mean that they should be free from change and transformation. There, is, there are still ways of delivering those important services differently. And I think we need to be careful that we don't get sucked into a, a conversation that says they need to be left alone. And therefore we can only look at the other stuff. And I don't think that's gonna, you know, instinctively that can't cut it. I think it goes back to fees and charges. Actually, we, a year ago, uh, 24 of the councils engaged in a benchmarking exercise across fees and charges, as an example. Um, so that kind of work does go on. I just want to see them increasing above the rate of inflation year on year. They obviously want to see things done a wee bit differently. But just, just to touch on one more thing, if that's okay, uh, convener. Um, uh, in paragraph 67, I mentioned obviously that I represent a constituency in North Ayrshire. Um, uh, you've said here the auditor for North Ayrshire IGB highlighted concerns that, and I quote, in the medium term, the IGB is faced with an extremely challenging financial position, and that's well known locally. In line with many other IGBs, it's not, uh, uh, it's not achieved short term financial balance, but it's not been deficit funded by its partners. And in the ex uh, Exhibit 14, you can see that it's the only. Um, local authority which is have a negative reserve some 5.8 million now you've mentioned um uh, three issues identified with financial management of the igbs including late agreement of budgets uh, poor financial monitoring due to delays and inaccuracies during the year 
and projected outturns forecast during the last quarter of 2017 were very different from what's actually achieved. So what has been the issue in, in, um, in North Ayrshire, IGB, which makes it different from all, all the other local authorities in, in terms of this? Because 5.8 million for a local authority with 135,000 people is quite a significant amount. I'll, I'll, I'll ask colleagues to talk about the specifics in, in, in a moment, but what, what we've tried to reflect is, is looking at North Asia from sort of two perspectives. On the one hand, um, the auditor of um, the IGB is quite clearly looking that, at that as an individual standalone entity, and they've quite rightly said there is this deficit position, which is concerning. Um, at the same time, if, if, if you look at North Ayrshire as, as an operating IJB, it, is it that different from the other 19 that are in deficit, but they're not showing a deficit in their accounts because they had additional funding from their partners? Uh, and, and that's really the difference between, between the two. In terms of why it's that way, I don't know if we can... Um, I won't be able to say why the detail. I think you know you making the link between Exhibit 14 and the points at, at 70 is a good is a good uh, point for us to pick up. Um, <clears throat> what's different is, as Graham has said, that the main issue is that, in common with many others, they're overspending in year. What's the difference is for the others, they are, that position is being squared off in the year, whereas for North Ayrshire Council, the host, the partner bodies, have taken the view that the IGB needs to redress that deficit position itself over the coming years. And really the only way it can do that is by reducing the funding that it gives to its partner bodies in future years um, to make good that deficit. So that's the difference, I think. It's just a difference in the approach by the host bodies into dealing with the deficit that's occurred within the IJB. So just, would it not be better to have a kind of standard approach here so that we can actually see much more clearly? Because that, it looks as if North Ayrshire stands out. I mean, in actual fact, um, um, given your explanation, it's perhaps not such a standout as, as uh, it seems from, from Exhibit 14. Well, well that, 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 that's the sense we're trying to get across and saying there are two ways to look at it. But, but the fact remains, it, 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 it is a legal entity and that is what the accounts show. And it exists as a fact, and um, so we, we have to record that, uh, and then we're trying to give a bit of context around that. Just, uh, yeah, I think a, a bit more explanation would have been quite useful there, because it, cause quite because then the committee could see that there are other local uh, IGBs which are also in, in real difficulty in terms of their funding and their service delivery. Fraser, okay, can be here. Thanks. Right, Alec, Alexander. Thank you, Mr. McKenna. Oh, sorry. You, you, my apologies, no, Alec Rowley. Okay. First, okay. First, yeah. Yeah. Just picking up where, where we left off with the North Ayrshire IGB, is, is it not the case? I mean, when, when I saw that a number of weeks ago, the North Ayrshire IGB, I thought it was actually a more transparent way of reporting. And one of the issues that comes up time and again when you speak to local councillors is that there is, they think, not a great deal of transparency around the whole fund and the IGBs. So is that not something that you should be looking at in terms of, if, if this is one way of reporting it, and I actually agree with Kenny that this is probably the most realistic uh, or, or most transparent way, is that not something you should be making recommendations on? So I'll start on that, Mr. So, so yes, and we are. And one of the reasons that we included more information on IGBs in this report than we have done in previous reports is to respond to exactly that challenge, I think. Lots of people, as uh, your colleagues in the Health and Sport Committee, amongst others, have said that there's a real lack of transparency around how IGB finances work, which is hugely significant because they are responsible for over £8 billion of public money, let's not forget. So so the bit at the top of the page, 29, actually, is where we've tried to, to demonstrate, having done some analysis, that 20 out of the 30 IGBs would have reported deficits had the partner bodies not done something about it in the year. So that's new information that we're putting into the public domain there for exactly that reason. And as, as the Chair has said, it is also the case that um, uh, North Ayrshire are presents it in a, in a particular way. You could argue that it's more, it's more transparent. Um, from, a, from a kind of selfish audit point of view and trying to pull together this report, consistency would be great for us. Um, it would make our lives an awful lot easier, but the reality is that there are 30 individual organisations with, with critically 30 different 
agreements um, and, and integration schemes that determine how you manage this kind of stuff. So we will absolutely continue to bang the drum for more transparency and try to bring that in the reports both locally in the work that Brian and his colleagues do in all the IGBs and also when we report nationally on integration. I'd, I'd just add that the, the point that, that Fraser met, made about them, them all having different agreements, not, not only um, is what each IGB does subject to, to its local arrangement, but, but its funding between NHS and the Council is also subject to its particular local agreement, and, and they vary across the country as well. OK, thanks. If I can briefly touch on a, a couple of other points. We, we talked about the distribution um, mechanisms. Um, is, is it not that there are... That you mentioned Aberdeen Council there. Aberdeen Council claim that they get a really raw deal out of the distribution factor. If you were looking more at terms of waiting on, on, on poverty and deprivation, you would say Glasgow gets a, a fairly raw deal compared to some. But is that not part of the problem that the local authorities amongst themselves, because there would be so many winners and losers depending on how you do this, so COSLA is not in a position to come up with, with a, a, a look again at the, the, the redistributing the finances, and the Scottish Government don't, I think, have the political will either. But that doesn't mean that we should continue to operate under a distribution system that's not taking account in modern Scotland. Where does that where does that leave us? And on the same point of distribution, the the, the, the 3.5 billion that is that is now coming in through separate fund. I mean, the fact that you say yourself that the me methodologies are not publicly available uh, and should be more transparent in terms of how that 3.5 billion has been distributed. Increasingly, we're seeing more money going into local authorities through through different methods. Uh, that surely can't be allowed to continue. That's not transparent. Um, I'm not entirely clear um, about the question within that, but in terms of what we've said within the report, we we recognise that essentially, while it's a sort of zero-sum game, and if, if you increase money to one local authority, it means money goes down for other local authorities, it, it, that's, a, that's a challenging environment in which, which to make adjustments. That, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't... Um, still pose the question, are you satisfied that the existing formula is actually meeting your objectives, given what you said these are to, to uh, both Scottish Government and, and COSLA? It's for them to then look at um, the, the, the formula and the effect it has and decide whether they are satisfied in the circumstances. And we wouldn't have a, have a view on that. I think what... So we absolutely recognise the, the challenges with this, Mr Riley. We know it's not a straightforward thing and we dipped, the Commission dipped its toe in the water on this topic last year and we're dipping a slightly bigger toe this year. Um, uh, because our, our point, I think, as I said last year, is a fairly simple one, which is, as you say, if, it, if, if fundamentally the thing hasn't changed in the last 10 years, it seems to us reasonable to ask a question about whether it is therefore still fit for purpose because the world has changed so much uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, and, and you mentioned also the point that it also seemed to me, I think I said uh, when I was here, when we were here last year, that if increasingly there are different mechanisms needing to be created for more, for a bigger proportion of the money, that does for us raise a question about the core funding formula. So, so our job is, is just to raise some of those questions and then, as you say, it's for government and, and COSLA to, to consider whether, whether and how they take that forward. I suppose sorry, this excuse me just one second. Sorry, Alec, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just noticing the time. We have got a lot to go through, so can we make sure that we we don't spend too much time in one issue and to, we to don't need everybody answering? To tighten that question, you, you, you had a clear policy direction coming through the the late Campbell Christie headed up a commission that talked about preventative spend. You then have clear policy directives coming out of the Scottish Government and the question of joined up government. Uh, but if, if the funding isn't isn't being targeted to fit with that policy objective, then then it's no wonder that it's not successful. It's maybe just a comment. Can can I finally ask? Local government funding has reduced at a faster rate than other areas of the Scottish public sector. Um, that's that's a very clear statement. So 
the Scottish Government tend to disagree with that and would argue that local governments had its fair share. Uh, and the public then end up confused as to who's, who's saying what. I mean, has local government maintained a fair share of Scottish public funding or has it not? Well, I think what we're reporting on is the numbers. Um, and, and the numbers are quite clear. And I think our figures are consistent with, with the SPICE numbers as well. And, and we reported over the four-year period that um, local government funding reduced in real terms by 6.92% compared to Scottish Government in, in, in funding in general of 1.65%. And that's consistent with the SPICE figures. In terms of making judgments about what's fair, that that's really comes down to policy and it's not our area. It's clear, Camina. Right, OK. Just for clarity then, does that uh, figure include the, the money that they raise from extra sources? The, the or is that just the government's funding of local authorities? So, sorry, are you... Is, is, is that, that the, the money that you're saying that funding has reduced at a faster rate, and is that the funding from central government? Yes. So it doesn't include the money that local authorities can raise in a way that, say, for example, the health service wouldn't be able to raise? No, no it doesn't. It's, right. it's the funding... Just for clarity, from... thank you. OK, thank you. That's clear, thank you. Uh, Graham. Um, yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I just wonder, I'll be very quick with, with, with my questions because I've covered, covered um, uh, a bit of IJBs, which, which I was going to ask about. Um, you, you mentioned transparency. We as a committee have uh, covered this before. You know, every year when we look at the budget, IJBs comes up, and it's all... It all gets a bit murky and it's sort of hard to figure out how much money is actually going into local government when we also have IJBs into the mix. Um, and, and every year we say the same, that, that we need more clarity. And you're, say, you're essentially saying that as well. So what, what do you think needs to be done? Well, I, I think that takes us um, to the Health and Social Care Integration Report, which um, we, we produced last month, where we set out a, a, a range of things we think need to be done. I think um, critically in terms of, of financing, we, we, we need um, to, to address not, not, not just the money in, in IGBs, but also financial planning in IGBs. And, uh, enable them to to have medium-term financial plans to to bring clarity and and a support to transformation programs that that, that need that that security of, of of finance to to be able to be carried through. But, I mean, Fraser, do you want to add anything um, on that? So it is, in terms of what needs to be done. I think there's there is something about the the IGB bit of this in terms of medium and long-term financial planning. I think what. What we've tried to do in the last couple of years, Mr Simpson, is bring some clarity. So Exhibit 2, we've tried to separate out the different bits of funding. And as you say, one of the big points of contention over the years has been what we're calling their health and social care funding via the NHS. Now, the reason we've not included that as core local government funding is, is that it goes into the health budget in technical terms, and then it is transferred to, to, uh, to integration authorities. Now, um, Government have said in the past that that therefore is money that goes to local government, and and I th I'm not sure that's entirely clear because what that money is actually spent on by an IGB may or may not be defined as obviously local government services. It could be spent on a, a community mental health nurse, for example. So, so that's why we think it's absolutely legitimate to to recognise that 357 million because it's significant, but it's also why we show it as a separate line. So. So I think that's maybe about as transparent as we can get on that front, and then it's for other people to decide whether it's part of the local government spend or not, to be honest. Um, but as I said earlier, we'll continue to bang the drum for increasing transparency, both in terms of the settlement and how that's arrived at, and as the Chair said, how the actual IGB funding is, is managed. Things we'll just say on the 357, the key things for us is it's not double counted, it's not counted in two places, both in the NHS and the local government, so that's why we will treat it in our reports as one place. Um, I think Exhibit 13 is our is our attempt, where, like it or not, in trying to def identify the flows and funding that go in and out of the IJB. Um, I think it's quite a hard position to present. Hopefully, we've tried to make it simple as possible in this, but I think there's more we can do as we go forward in trying to present those cash fl those uh, funds flows that happen between the host bodies, the NHS and local government, the IJB, and the funding that is given back to the NHS and the councils to provide services. 
Okay, I'll move on from IJBs. Um, can we talk about uh, reserves? Because um, there's a, a, a bit of a section on that in, in the report. Um, uh, and there's a wide uh, variation in, in what councils are doing and how, how, how much reserves they have. Um, if you look at Exhibit 7, um, usable reserves as a percentage of council annual revenue, um, and you go from, uh, well, the, the island authorities uh, seem to do very, very well, Orkney and Shetland, and then if we go into the mainland, Renfrewshire, um, you got a high level of reserves, all the way down to um, Aberdeenshire, which doesn't have as have as much. So is you know is is there an issue there? That that wide variation. I, I mean clearly that there, there is a variation, and I think um, what what we do with that is we look at each council in its own context, because councils approach how they provide for how they provide reserves on on different bases. Uh, what matters to us is that the, the basis on which the, 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 the reserves are calculated is consistent with their financial planning and, and has been thought through. And it's not, say, a rule of thumb or a number that, that, that just happens to drop out at, at, at the end of the calculation, that, that, that there is there is a logic behind the level of reserves, and different councils have approached this in different ways. Um, but but that, that's judged by each auditor each year as, uh, in terms of financial sustainability, looking at reserves, looking at debt, looking at the, the, the financial planning. And as we do our best value reports around, around the councils, we, we, we see in more detail the, the different approaches councils take. But, but it's, it's an area along with with the medium-term financial planning approach that we've emphasised over the last few years, and generally councils are um, improving significantly at. But Brian, you can... I can give a bit of a flavour of this on Exhibit 7. I mean, it does, it does come down to very different approaches, very different treasury approaches within councils. I mean, at one end there of that, uh, of the mainland uh, councils, you've got Renfrewshire, who will put money away into capital funds to spend over a number of years in the future. Whereas if you can Trust that with somewhere like North Lanarkshire, they will buy. They will um, have capital expenditure each year out of their in-year revenue reserves, um, or they could resort to borrowing because they have quite a bit of borrowing headroom. So it's a very different approach um, to reserves, and I think that's what Exhibit Seven is really intended to highlight: that you have very, very different reserve positions across councils. One of the things I would say that we do do quite consistently across the audits is. Um, and it, it builds on the Northamptonshire point earlier, is we're very interested in the councils that are planning to use up their uh, free general fund reserves over a period of time. And I think in last year's report, we highlighted a few councils where it looks as if some councils might run out of their free general reserve within three years. Now, <clears throat> In, in 1718, 1819, councils are not planning to use reserves in that same extent. So those three councils that we had concerns about in the previous report, we don't have concerns about now. They don't look as if they will run out within three years. Um, so that's a key point, a key point that we'll continue to monitor, given the example of the Northampton shoot we used earlier in the report. So we are very keen on looking at the reserves position, but it is quite a complicated picture um, across the councils because of very different approaches to how reserves are built up and used. Okay, okay for another one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, Convena. Um, so I think reserves and debt kind of very, very much linked, and you've got a similar uh, picture on debt where um, you've, you've got um, sort of net borrowing varying from 45% uh, of revenue in Shetland to 203% in West Dumbartonshire, that's um, a, a huge difference. Um, now I don't, I, I don't know whether that's an issue or, or not, but um, you do say you do say in your report that some councils will need to borrow further over the long term to provide the cash to spend on commitments identified in their reserves, uh, and that would increase debt. Um, you go on to make the point which you've made earlier that council councillors need to be aware of, of what they're doing um, and the decisions they're taking. And I, 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 I sometimes wonder, having been a councillor, um, 
whether that is the case and whether they uh, are as informed or have the level of understanding that, that they should have on these very complicated issues. Um, well, I'll, I'll answer on the general debt and I'll ask Brian to talk about the internal borrowing point you raised. Um, and uh, as I sort of referred to in the answer to the previous question, yes, reserves, debt and financial planning are all part of the one the one issue. The, the, the whole thing's got to make sense as a whole. And um, you, you chose Western Bartonshire as the highest um, level of debt and we had a best value report. Uh, on Western Bartonshire a few months ago, and, and it was actually a very good report. So um, clearly when they, they, they were looked at, that debt in the context of what they were doing and why they had the borrowing and what they were doing with the borrowing uh, made sense, and, and, and the overall judgment was good. And, and I would say the position um, is even more varied than the numbers show because you have different types of debt. You, you have debt that, that's fixed rate debt, you have debt that's floating rate debt, and uh, we were talking about Aberdeen, you, you have debt that's, that's index-linked debt, and, and that's got a very different risk profile from, from the, the other more conventional forms of debt. So, so you really need to look at each council in its own in that respect and, and take a, a, a round picture of what, what's the asset side and the liability side and does it make sense. Now on the internal borrowing side. Please, we are. Brief. Okay. I think you're right to mention reserves and debt. The missing bit in the middle of that is the cash and investments that sit to support those reserves. Um, I think our Exhibit 9 is the attempt to show that, is that many councils have used cash and investments so would have to borrow further in order to support their reserves position. So that, that is the issue around underlying debt, not just the debt that sits on the balance sheet at the moment. Um, I think the important thing for us is, you know, this is development um, approach. We are introducing some of these ideas for the first time in this report. Particularly as we go forward, I would like to explore further in further years reports about the affordability and the extent of commitments like debt uh, and sort of servicing of that debt, um, but also issues like we mentioned at Exhibit 12, which is the commitment to meet past decisions on early retirements, for example. Um, so that's something we want to develop further in reports going forward. On your point about informing members, I don't underestimate the value of the overview report in terms of informing both members and practitioners. I think it's quite a powerful tool. I've been an auditor for 25 years in local government, and it, things that are said within the report um, have a real impact in the same way that we said a number of years, the Commission said a number of years ago, about the need to develop medium and long-term planning. Well, you can see in this report that we have a position where I think 30 of the councils now have medium-term financial plans. So the reports do have impact, um, and I think that's an area in terms of the affordability of these commitments is something that we'll take forward and develop further. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll just, just make one yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. It's, just a, it's a point, it's not a question, because um, others have questions. Um, I'm just thinking um, for, for councillors, when they have to make these important decisions, um, they're advised by uh, officers, um, and it might be an idea if th if they had some some kind of independent voice advising them on you know, what the impact of certain decisions might be. It's just a point. It's not a question. Okay, thank you, uh, Alexander. You what, thank you, you convener. You, you've you've spent this morning talking a lot about the medium term financial planning and and mm -hmm. identified that the majority, if not all, councils have now got that in place. But you've also identified within the report that a significant number of them do not have the long-term planning that possibly is required to ensure that they do capture what they're planning to do in the future. Now, why is it the case that you think that these individuals choose not to have the, the long-term planning and what risks are they putting themselves at and the council by not doing that? As, as Fraser mentioned uh, a few questions ago, um, it's not that many years ago that um, many, many councils were on a year-on-year -year basis. And, and we started by emphasising the importance of medium-term financial planning. And now we're in a position where nearly everyone is doing the medium-term. Um, and about half have some sort of long-term, with maybe about a third having scenario long-term planning. And, and so we are continuing to press to... to, to raise the bar and get and get the long term um, across the board. And I, I would say the direction of travel on that has been very positive and I would hope in a, a year or two we, we succeed in, in having uh, more long term plans as well. And, and 
identified last year, and you've touched on three councils that were in a, a very difficult situation with your planning and process about what they would see to happen to them if they continued. And that, you now believe, has changed. Uh, that, that those three, and Clackmannan is one that falls into my area, uh, that, that, that was identified as having those difficulties. Uh, so what have they done now that gives you that confidence, uh, along with the others that are now seeing that, well, the, 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 con the concern that was identified uh, in the last report was that based on, on the plans that, that councils had, just doing the arithmetic, you, you'd use up all the reserves in two to three years. And that's no longer the case. So councils have addressed that. But that, I mean, obviously, that's still in terms of their plans. I mean, Clark, Clark Manager, as, as you'll know, is, is, is a, uh, an area we had, we had a specific concern about. And, and we've asked um, Fraser as controller uh, to come back to, to the Commission with a report in a few months to, to see how they've been addressing that. And there were more issues there than, than simply uh, the arithmetic on the, the reserves. Kelsey, just frankly, I think that the issue that's changed between 17, 18, 18, 19 is what we cover at paragraph 30. I think a number of councils were um, felt unable, perhaps, to agree significant changes to budgets with the change in administration around local government elections. So I think in, 60, in um, 17, 18, we probably saw a bit of a blip in terms of them resorting more to using reserves. I think we see the early signs of that in the 18, 19 uh, budget proposals, it's, it, there's less of a dip into reserves. Um, and we'll just monitor that position to see what happens um, through into 1920. Because the, 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 there is now some stability uh, across many of those councils that were, that were in uh, a situation uh, of, of complex uh, financial management. Uh, and by addressing and putting in some of the transformation uh, that's become quite apparent, uh, and also looking at what others are doing, uh, that has given them that opportunity to develop and progress. Yes, they take on board that they, they need to have plans other than using the, the reserves. Now, of course, um, half the risk is in implementing the plans, um, so that, that, that still remains out there, as it were, but um, we'll monitor that as, as we go forward. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Alexander. Annabelle, would you like hey, to come Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I wanted to raise an issue <coughs> which I assume you may be aware of, which concerns uh, equal pay and pensions, and, in fact, this was drawn to our attention uh, uh, by uh, our colleague Linda Fabiani, MSP for East Kilbride, writing to the Equality and Human Rights Committee of this Parliament, who in turn have uh, corresponded with us on the matter, and I think with the Public Audit and post legislative Scrutiny Committee. And essentially the issue is uh, that in terms of equal pay claims, um, some are being paid by way of... The, the, the back pay is being paid by way of a pay mechanism, others are being paid by way of compensation. Uh, I understand that if you are in a larger salary, being paid by way of compensation might be more attractive because of tax implications. But if you're not, then obviously that is not so attractive and would be diminishing your pension entitlement. Now, it seems further to uh, <coughs> uh, investigations that have been made that actually no public body takes any responsibility for enforcement of the relevant legislation, which I understand is the Local Government Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2014. Uh, and I understand also that the SPPA uh, issued a circular on 12th October 2016 uh, regarding uh, some of the matters brought in by that earlier set of regulations uh, and clarified the policy intent that a payment of arrears of pay made in respect of an equal pay claim should be treated as pensionable. Uh, this is not happening in many, many local authorities uh, uh, involved. And I just wonder, first of all, if you could clarify whether you're aware of this. And secondly, within the scope of your relevant remits, what, what can be done to ensure that legislation is actually being complied with? Um, if, I, if I may, I'll make some general contextual comments and then uh, Fraser can comment in, in more detail. Um, as you know, we produced an equal pay report last year. Um, and that was a very challenging report to, to write for a number of reasons. We, we noted that data was very difficult to, to obtain. And also, uh, because of the nature of the framework and, and the fact it's subject to litigation, that there was, frankly, a sort of moving target and that there were cases in, in train um, that, that would affect the position. So there was very little we could say definitively at, 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 that, at that time. And I think from our point of view, um, from, a, from an audit perspective, we, we are very interested in uh, the progress of individual councils in, in implementing equal pay and the impact that has on their financial position. 
and um, we, we need to ensure that, that the agreements are properly accounted for. What we're not involved in is the negotiation between the parties or um, the regulations which the SPP issue. And as you say, we don't have any enforcement role, but that's the sort of general uh, background and, and Fraser. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah, it was a really helpful, I mean, really good piece in, in the Herald, I think, originally that yeah. started it. And, to, to um, and Sunday Herald. Uh, Sunday Herald, sorry. And uh, we, we got the, the correspondence sent on to us via Papples, as you say. So, so absolutely, we're aware of it. Um, we've written back to, to Linda Fabiani. We've copied the convener in, both conveners of this committee and uh, Papples, to say that, first of all, we absolutely recognise the issue. Um, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we should have mentioned it in our national report. I'm not sure there was much more we would have, we would have been able to say at that point because that was right in the middle of there being some genuine uncertainty, I think, about the application of the 2014 regulation. And as you say, that's why the... The Scottish Public Pensions Agency sent, in fact, two clarification uh, circulars and letters out on that. So we were right in the middle of all of that. But that said, it would have been helpful if we'd um, reflected it. Uh, I think in terms of our, our role and what we're doing now, two main things, I think. One is that every year we put out guidance to all of, all of our auditors, and the guidance in the past has mentioned this issue, so it has had a, a, a reference to uh, Section 20, as it's technically known, of the 2014 regulations. We're going to emphasise that more this year, and in, and in particular, ensuring that auditors are fully understanding and looking at the difference between um, what's what's uh, classed as arrears of pay and what's classed as compensation, because that's the key differential. Uh, and second of all, we routinely follow up um, all of our national reports with what we call an impact report, and we will build this issue into that impact report, which will be uh, later in 2019. Um, my final point, convener, I guess, would be that um, I think I think colleagues have raised a really important point about whose job it is to enforce this, because it isn't clear. Um, I think part of the difficulty, and the chair mentioned this, is that even though the guidance is now clear that um, if it's back pay and arrears, that would be pensionable, and if it's compensation, it isn't, that that is still subject to a negotiation locally. So the terms that are agreed locally will decide whether it's a compensation agreement or whether it's back pay. And that, so, so I don't think there's a simple thing that says that one's wrong and that one's right. This is still a, a process of negotiation between uh, staff members and their representatives uh, and the councils concerned. Certainly what we will want to do, I think, and this is the fair challenge for us, is to have a better understanding just of what the picture is. Uh, and I think the Sunday Herald have, have started that job in a sense. Uh, and that's part of the reason for putting more guidance out to our auditors next year. Thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that obviously you're taking the matter very seriously and that uh, further information will be forthcoming. Um, I mean, obviously for individuals affected, um, you know, they're losing out twice. <laughs> they've lost out in their pay and they're losing out in their pension. So I don't really think this is something that we can just kind of, uh, you know, monitor by way of footnotes and reports and so forth. I think this is something that has to really be looked into in that regard. I mean, um, Audit Scotland, have they been doing anything on, on this issue in particular? Well, so, I, I, so I should have said, I, I, in a sense, I'm talking for both Oh, I see you are. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I just wondered if they had anything Audit to Scotland, add. Because Audit Scotland carries out the work on behalf of the, oh, the Commission okay. in order to general. So, um, so, so absolutely, we'll, we'll be looking at it. And, and our auditors audit all local and indeed okay. all all public bodies on behalf of the Commission in order to general. And the guidance goes out to all of them. So, so we'll, we'll be raising the issue across the piece. So we would expect to see this in a future Audit Scotland report? So certainly when we do the, the impact report um, of this of the original equal pay report, which was in councils, we'll follow up as part of that. And certainly locally we'll be asking auditors to have a look at the specific issue um, uh, as part of the next year's audit work. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've, we've uh, sort of run over time. I'd just like to, and I know Andy had a couple of questions. Well, just one, Andy, and very brief, very brief. So that, thank you very much, um, Convener. Uh, just three brief clarifications regarding para 18, where it says the base of the calculations for the separate methods are not publicly available. Just to be clear, have you seen these? You no, don't have them either. No. Right. Um, second point, um, in Exhibit 5, um, about council tax increases, Dundee at the right-hand side there has applied a 3% increase in council tax, but it's got no banding and volume changes. Is that because they don't know it, or I mean... There must be some houses that have been built in Dundee. 
<coughs> you could perhaps come back to me on that. Yes, if we're we can do that. Tight on time. Um, and finally, on Exhibit 3, would it be possible for you to produce that data uh, disaggregated into revenue grant and NDR so that we can see the relative impact of both? It's possible to do, but it's not really relevant because what, what happens is is the proportion of NDR and grant, and, um, grant changes council to council, sometimes because councils... As an example, my understanding is South Lanarkshire Council collects NDR on behalf of all utility businesses. So the relative proportion it gets in NDR as part of the pot is bigger than it gets in the other element. So it's, it, you have to take the two as a whole. Disaggregating them will tell you very little, I think. OK, don't bother doing that then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy. So I'd just like to... A uh, final question. Uh, we talk about the implica uh, implications of transformational change programmes within the councils, you know, and whether they've had a destabilising effect, and also whether workforce planning has been carried out efficiently and, most importantly, with effective leadership place where's your view on that and how important is the effective leadership well I, I think leadership is extremely important and and we continue to emphasize that and by leadership we mean uh, members and council officers and we also mean all members because i think all members whether they're in administration or, or opposition have a responsibility for the, the 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 corporate running of the council as an organization and that's increasingly important as they come under financial pressure um we, we will be looking uh, at the service end in, in our second overview in, in the spring, and that's where we'll, we'll have a, a sort of better view on the issues of transformational change. As I say, this report more focuses on the f funding side of the, of the sort of balance sheet, as it were. So we can expect to get something yeah. from you later on then? Yes. OK, and in that case, can I just thank you very much for your uh, answers to our, our questions? and for your attendance here today, and I will suspend the, the session. <laughs>